Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board. I'm going to convene this meeting of the Green Mountain Care Board for the purposes of two hospital budget hearings this morning. One is Grace Cottage and one is Springfield. And at this point, um, I want uh, members of the public to know that after each hospital budget presentation, there is an opportunity for public comment. And also we have an open public comment period that is on our website and anyone can offer a public comment on any budget or hospital budgets in general by logging into the Green Mountain Care Board website and going to that public comment portal. At this time, Kim, if you could swear in Doug and Steve. Do you please raise your right hands? Do you swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. Thank you. Great. So, um, Doug, whenever you're ready, you can just proceed. Great. Happy to. So, uh, as the as the smallest hospital in the state of Vermont, uh, I anticipate that uh, we should be able to get through this uh, probably pretty efficiently uh, and perhaps quite a bit more quickly than some of the other presentations you've heard this couple the past week or more. Um, and uh, we're really happy to be able to, to, to do this. We're happy to be able to do it uh, via Zoom, given what's going on with, with the virus and uh, keeping us distanced and, and safe. Um, we are um, uh, very much ensconced in, um, in managing the, the pandemic here in our local um, communities and are very much uh, uh, looking forward to uh, starting the process of giving third uh, vaccines to people who are um, uh, who qualify for the first wave of those vaccines starting in September. Um, and we're going to continue our fight and keep uh, uh, the good work going so that we can, can beat this thing and, and hopefully get our get back to normal and uh, you know someday uh, have our meetings face to face again, which I think would be nice. Um, you know, Stephen and I, we've been here before. We've been introduced this morning. Uh, and just as a quick overview, because uh, I know I know you you already are quite familiar with Grace Cottage. Uh, I know our organization quite well. We're a, a 19 bed critical access acute and swing bed facility. Um, we have a full time emergency department. We have diagnostic imaging, uh, including X-ray, CT. Uh, ultrasound, uh, bone densitometry. Uh, we have a, a, a laboratory on, on campus and we provide rather extensive inpatient and outpatient rehabilitation. Uh, we have six hospitalists that cover our inpatient facility and manage the bedside care of our patients who are here uh, when they're admitted. Um, we, uh, I like to tell people that we're Unlike a lot of uh, small hospitals that have rural health clinics associated, affiliated with them, attached to them, we're kind of like the, the opposite of that in that um, we're really uh, probably more so a, a rural health clinic with a small hospital attached. Our rural health clinic is, uh, is extremely busy, uh, uh, does a lot of um, direct patient care uh, uh, within the facility. We have a, um, an extensive uh, team of providers. We have nine uh, family practitioners. Uh, we have two pediatricians, a behavioral health provider, and two uh, licensed clinical social workers um, that uh, take care of patients in our rural health clinic. Um, and we're currently recruiting for a second uh, psychiatric provider, probably a nurse practitioner or PA. Um, we, uh, we are also currently recruiting uh, for primary care providers as well. Uh, uh, we are uh, going through some transition. Uh, we, we we're losing two of our uh, primary care providers, a, a, a pediatrician and a, uh, and a family practitioner who are moving out to the Midwest. And so we are uh, we're actively in the recruitment phase to uh, replace them. Um, we also have an on-campus uh, retail pharmacy, uh, Messenger Valley Pharmacy, which is extremely busy here locally and is extremely convenient for the people who live in this region. The nearest retail pharmacy from uh, towns in Vermont 
uh, is in Brattleboro, which is about half an hour uh, south of us. Um, my team uh, uh, loves to remind me that, to remind uh, listeners that uh, we're an extremely uh, well um, uh, received organization. We're extremely popular. Um, and for the second year in a row, we've won um, uh, seven uh, best of, of Brattleboro awards. These are um, awards that are voted on by the people who uh, who are readers of the of the news, local newspaper. And uh, this year, as as we did last year, we won best hospital, best doctor, best pediatrician, best pharmacy. Uh, best physical therapy, best emergency department, and best place to work, which is probably the most uh, uh, the, the most impressive of all of those awards. Best place to work. Uh, our turnover. I was just talking with my my HR director yesterday. Our turnover rate at Grace Cottage uh, continues to be quite low, and actually quite a bit lower than the national average, which tells you that people who work here like working here, and they tend to stay at Grace Cottage. Uh, we uh, we have a mission of uh, serving the healthcare needs of our community. Uh, obviously, our focus is on wellness, uh, relieving suffering, and restoring health. But most important to to us and to those who count on Grace Cottage for their care is we develop a very close relationship with our patients. Um, that relationship um, is uh, is is one that is uh, respected and cultivated uh, from the, the, the first visit of a patient when they're a new patient uh, until the time that they stop coming to Grace Cottage. Uh, they see their provider on a regular basis. We manage their wellness through a number of programs, through data, through communication channels and vehicles. Um, we provide them with feedback. We have a, a patient portal. Uh, they can talk to and communicate with their providers regularly and continuously. Uh, we give them frequent reminders when it's time for them to come in for blood pressure checks, for wellness visits, for physicals. Uh, if they're uh, uh, being managed for a, uh, a chronic issue, we communicate with them regularly about testing and about follow-up care, about follow-up visits. Uh, we make sure that, uh, that their care is being managed uh, rather than re relying on our patients to have to remember what to do and when to do it. And I think that really uh, separates us quite a bit from the competition in, in that, um, you know, we are, we're a smaller organization and we, we can really have a close and cultivated relationship with every single one of our patients. Uh, our vision, obviously, is to, to have that personalized relationship, uh, to provide that accessible primary care to be available when patients need us, whether they're an established patient or whether they're just somebody visiting the area who happens to have an acute issue and calls to sit to see if they can see somebody. Uh, we pro provide them with a quick and convenient uh, uh, appointment slot. We have accessibility at Grace Cottage to provide quick and get convenient appointments. Um, and we stay ahead of the curve because we don't wait until our appointment times uh, are drifting out further and further. Uh, it's our goal to make sure that we can provide quick and convenient access. And so it's one of the reasons why we're aggressively recruiting right now to stay ahead of the curve and to make sure we have enough providers with enough access to get people in quickly and conveniently. Um, we provide very competent inpatient care, predominantly swing patient care for patients who are post-acute and need uh, rehabilitation and focus in order to prepare themselves to return home after their episode of care. So we coordinate and collaborate with other acute care organizations, uh, proceduralists in the region, and uh, uh, we are very well respected for our follow-up swing and rehabilitation services. Our emergency department is open 24-7. Um, we pride ourselves in that we have a very tiny waiting room because we don't believe that patients should have to wait for an emergency provider. Uh, so our goal is to get them into a room as soon as they walk through the door and to make sure that uh, we're providing quick and timely um, triage evaluation and care planning for those with emergency 
um, issues and service and need emergency services. We also have an extremely uh, close relationship with uh, tertiary care facilities and trauma centers, and we have um, an incredible transportation mechanism for people who might need a higher level of care that they can't get at Grace Cottage. And we regularly receive um, positive feedback from providers at uh, tertiary and trauma center locations that receive our patients, thanking us for so doing such an incredibly comprehensive and competent um, job of evaluating, triaging, and documenting uh, before transferring patients to their care. Uh, so we really pride ourselves in having that close affiliation and relationship. Uh, our focus is on preventive care, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're, our goal is to keep people out of the hospital. Uh, we don't have any beds for, for, for you know, patients um, that, are, that are waiting for people to, uh, uh, to show up because they haven't been managed and, and haven't had a comprehensive wellness and preventive care. Um, we, we prefer to keep our patients at home in the community and well cared for. Um, and, and it's one of the things that I think, again, separates us from a lot of full service community hospitals that rely on procedures and interventions to drive revenue and volume. We really don't. We don't do procedures here. We don't have an operating room. Uh, we don't do anything uh, internally uh, in terms of a, a procedural uh, based services. So for us, it's really all about uh, seeing the, the acute patients showing up in our ED, hopefully treating them and sending them home. Uh, if they need to be admitted uh, as an acute, we admit them, take care of them on a short uh, basis and get them home as quickly as we possibly can or to a higher level of care if they need it. Uh, so our, our, our focus is really on wellness and to treat the entire person as our, our vision says. Um, uh, next slide, Catherine. Uh, so you, you have our, um, our requested budget for fiscal 22. Uh, the net patient service revenue uh, number in that budget is uh, based on uh, current volume run rates with, uh, with two slight areas of, of decrease that we're, pre we're preparing for. Uh, and uh, those two are first and foremost, uh, a return to, to somewhat normal outpatient laboratory volume. As you know, uh, for the last year and a half, with COVID testing being as, uh, as brisk and busy as it's been, our outpatient laboratory volumes have been uh, quite a bit higher than normal. Um, and we anticipate that as the pandemic uh, begins to wane, uh, hopefully as the pandemic begins to wane, uh, we could potentially see a drop in some of our outpatient laboratory volume. So we factor that into our, uh, our NPR for 22. Uh, again, I also mentioned uh, that we are in the process of recruiting uh, at the provider level. Uh, so we're anticipating, at least for a period of time in 22, uh, a drop in, in total visits uh, to our provider practice uh, as quickly as we can re recruit uh, providers to fill that void, the quicker we can return to, to uh, uh, continuous growth in our rural health clinic. Um, our NPR growth uh, uh, request is, is somewhat modest, but it's really, and I'm sure you've heard this from other hospitals that have presented to you, uh, we need to have some growth in NPR at Grace Cottage in order to cover uh, the increasing operating expenses that we're seeing uh, due to both supply and demand. Uh, uh, there's a, a tremendous inflation right now in healthcare supply uh, costs. Um, the pandemic has created problems for the supplier uh, vendors, uh, and they're passing those increased costs, fuel costs, shipping costs, manufacturing costs, onto us, the consumers, and we're having to pay higher prices for uh, goods and services and supplies. So we, we really need to have some growth in order to cover that increase in and operating expenses. And um, as you've heard from us before, and you'll probably continue to hear from us, we can, we, we're continuing to see uh, a somewhat continuous shift uh, in payer mix from uh, commercial to uh, Medicaid and, and self-pay uh, uh, payer classifications. And that's consistent with what we saw in 21, and we factored that into our uh, budget for fiscal 22. 
Um, and with that, I want to pass the the slide deck over to Stephen, and he'll get uh, uh, he'll, he'll uh, cover some of the more granular aspects of our budget uh, request for next year. Stephen. Help if I unmute. Um, Catherine, the income statement slide. So you have in your packet that was submitted the this slide, which is um, shows our current year budget adjusted for COVID-related expenses and our submitted budget for next year. Um, overall net patient revenue increase from projection to budget is a 6.1% increase, which includes um, the rate increase as well as um, change, not, well, our overall volumes are drastically different some of the areas that they are, and it makes a big difference in our net patient revenue, such as we get reimbursed much higher on inpatient versus outpatient stays. Um, so the mix, slight mix of where services lie makes a big difference in that. Um, our, as Doug said, our request is essentially a flat volumed budget going forward. Um, we truly expect in a lot of areas especially if we find the providers we're currently looking for and the physical therapist based on our result for the last few months, I would expect a, an increase in our um, volume in those areas, but I didn't want to overestimate. I, my presumption is this is a best guess, not uh, pessimistic, but reasonable expectation of what our volumes will be for the coming year. Uh, the expense side, however, I think I am hopeful, I should say, that it's an pessimistic outlook and that we can keep our expenses lower than that. Um, that being said, I'm not sure, you know, sitting here today, even what's changed in the last month or so, um if that's reasonable knowing that costs continue to increase above and beyond what doug was talking about particularly in travelers and things like that and i'll talk about that a little more when we get to the operating expense page but overall i think our 22 budget is completely achievable it's not particularly far above from a net patient revenue standpoint what we budgeted for the current year and considering most of the current year or much of the current year early on particularly was still highly affected by covid um, it is a truly reasonable expectation um, balance sheet catherine the balance sheet continues to look stronger at Grace Cottage than it has in years. Um, I'm not sure how to say this, but in some ways, COVID has actually been a positive thing for us, um, particularly in some of the revenues that we received as a result of that. Um, it has helped our cash position significantly. Um, the payroll protection loan, especially, which as I should have mentioned that on the income statement, but you saw in the narrative that we did indeed get almost a $3 million payroll protection loan early on in the process, which was forgiven a couple of months ago and thus showed up in, as revenue, recognized as revenue in fiscal year 21. And that is reven uh, cash, essentially sitting on our balance sheet that is ours to keep versus the Medicare advance monies, which are slowly being repaid. Those are all so all still in our account and ready to be repaid. We fortunately were not required to use any of those. 
and that liability will continue to decrease as Medicare recoups that money over the next couple of years. Next slide. Cash flow statement gives you a quick look at where our cash balance went. You can see at the end of 2019 to the end of 2020 was a significant change, all entirely a result of the COVID related funds that we had in the bank, a combination of the payroll protection money, the HRSA CARES Act fund, and the Medicare advance monies. And that will continue going forward through the end of the 21 as well as into 22, keeping us a large positive balance until all of that Medicare advance money is paid back. Next slide. Our overall chain rate increase request was 5%. Um, I felt and calculated that that was the minimum amount necessary to get us a large enough net patient revenue to cover all of the increased operating expenses we've outlined. Um, that is the highest rate increase we've had in the last several years. It's been 3.2 for the last few years. Um, it gives us an overall per gross patient revenue projection when once you adjust um, for the COVID things of 3.6% from 21 projection to 22 budget and a 2.8% increase from 21 budget to 22 budget. Next slide. Grace Cottage does not have any adjustments or provider transfers or accounting adjustments to report. So that keeps it simple. Next slide. Included in our other operating and non-operating revenue lines, um, as I just discussed in other operating revenue for the 21 projection, we include the grant revenue of $2.97 million in payroll protection money. There's also a small amount of additional CARES Act funding recognized in fiscal year 21 of the money that we had had left over as of September 30th last year. We will be returning our unused funds later when we do the reporting in September for that. Um, the other items included in our other operating revenue are our 340B retail pharmacy program of roughly $1 million in fiscal year 21 and $1.1 million in fiscal year 22. And our retail pharmacy that Doug mentioned operates at a loss of approximately 130,000 in 21 and 178,000 in 22. Non-operating revenue continues to be the large community support we get, which has in all of my years at Grace Cottage, going on 35 or so now, have what have been always allowed Grace Cottage to continue to exist in most years. Next slide. Operating expenses are drastically up in a lot of areas, not as a result of any new programs, as a result of anything out of the ordinary from a daily operating standpoint, aside from simply increased costs to maintain the normal operations. The cost of supplies is significant as Doug outlined. Other areas, as you well know, salary and benefits and staffing are by far our biggest percentage of operating expenses. We've had to do market adjustments in a lot of areas to maintain competitiveness with surrounding areas as to in order to recruit and retain qualified staff. For the positions that we have not yet filled, we currently have more travelers in the building than we have ever had in all my years here. It's rare that we have more than a couple and usually just nurses. Sometimes we have one in some other ancillary area. As of today, we have four traveling nurses on our floor. We have one traveling nurse in our rural health clinic, which is a first. We have two 
physical therapy travelers. We've never had more than one there. And we just posted yesterday for a traveling radiology tech, which is as a result of someone leaving due to our um, mandatory COVID vaccine policy going into effect October 1st. And I, as I've outlined in the narrative, the cost of travelers has skyrocketed. At this time last year, we were paying about $65 an hour for a nurse traveler RN on the nursing floor. Right now we're paying 120 or 130 and may need to increase that. We just, one of the travelers that's currently in the building is leaving mid contract to go to a, she's not only leaving here, she's leaving the traveling company she's working with to go to a different traveling company at a higher rate. And that's according to the traveling company happening a lot across the board. It's just, you know, there's such a shortage of nursing staff that they can demand anything they want essentially. And that's a drastic cost increase. You know, when you're paying two and going on three times what it costs for a regular staff person, um, but the alternative is not being able to treat the patients and that's not an alternative. We have patients, we need to take care of those patients. Um, but essentially operating expenses are up across the board in a lot of areas and it's, we do our best to maintain and decrease those and hold them tight wherever we can. But some things we simply do not have control over. Next slide, Catherine. So as I said, our budget is extremely conservative as it relates to expected net patient revenue. Um, it's not any drastic volume expectations that I feel we cannot achieve. It's essentially exactly what we're doing right now. It's been very consistent the entire year um, as far as pretty much everything across the board. The expense budget, as I said, is high due to inflated costs, particularly mostly as a result of COVID-19. We do have a positive total margin budgeted for 22, but that is based on the generosity of our com community and allowing us to continue to exist and our community being willing to cover the lack of particularly Medicaid reimbursement. Um, you know, Medicare reimbursement for our facility due to our high percentage of Medicare patients in both the hospital and the rural health clinic is close to at least covering their costs. It doesn't completely. Um, commercial, in most cases, pays a little better than cost. And as we've discussed year after year, and you are well aware, Medicaid pays less than half the cost of taking care of their patients. And unfortunately, as Doug pointed out, and as you'll see, can see in our net patient revenue columns, this current year and what I projected going forward, the medic percentage of Medicaid patients has gone up as commercial has gone down as again, as a result of COVID-19, people losing their jobs, losing their health insurance. And that is not something truthfully that we have any control over. We just have to try and adjust and cover that in ever increasing decrease in reimbursement. Next slide. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Doug so he can talk about our risks and opportunities. He's got to unmute it first, though. Thanks, Stephen. I appreciate uh, uh, Stephen's comments. Um, this has really been a, a, a incredibly um, unique year for for Grace Cottage, with everything going on, with 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 the the way we're we're running the organization, with the demands on on our our hospital, uh, with the pandemic, with the change in demographics change in payer mix. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting when you look at, at this year uh, as a whole and you, and you, and you look at, at just your know, volume and performance relative to prior years, uh, this is 
probably been one of our best, if not our best year ever at Grace Cottage. Um, if you if you uh, you adjust out uh, uh, you know uh, some of the cash from from the the COVID related assistance we received uh, from the feds, um, and you look at what we brought in through our philanthropy program this year, which is uh, a record year for us. Uh, we're 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 going to finish this this fiscal year just shy of two million dollars in uh, uh, in, in uh, gifts uh, to Grace Cottage, which is a record uh, highest of all time for for our organization. Uh, and you look at our um, our non operating revenue and the performance of our our endowment is uh, is at a record high, uh, as high as high as it's ever been at Grace Cottage. Uh, our um, our non-operating revenue from investments is at a record high. Um, so when you factor all, all that together, we we actually uh, all we probably if not for the pandemic, we, we we could possibly have finished this year with with a, a positive um, margin uh, on operations, which is something we we almost never do at Grace Cottage. So we're really we're really happy with with our performance. Uh, uh, all of our strategic initiatives for this past year uh, have paid off in terms of uh, growing access, uh, recruiting providers, uh, marketing uh, new services, uh, changing the way we we allow patients to to enter our organization and our system. Um, Every, uh, the, the way we manage productivity at the provider level, um, uh, the performance of our emergency department and the reputation that those providers have developed in our community, which has allowed us to grow our ED business. Um, you know, everything is kind of firing on all, all cylinders right now. And, and so we're really happy about that. And uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, as Stephen said, you know th this is this is not has not been a bad year. If anything, it's actually been a good year for Grace Cottage. Uh, there are, however, still risks that we have to be prepared for. Um, you know this this uh, Delta variant that we're seeing popping up. Uh, we're seeing you know obviously numbers in the state of Vermont uh, uh, slowly climbing for number of patients uh, hospitalized on any given day uh, across the state, uh, which is not a good trend to see. Uh, but it's because of the variant and it's because of the fact that there are still Vermonters that aren't vaccinated yet. And the initial vaccine that we all received is starting to, uh, it's effective, it's starting to wane over time, which is one of the reasons why we're all going to be looking at the option of, of getting a booster shot to keep those, uh, uh, those immunities uh, strong. But we have to, to be prepared in the event that we see things get worse before they get better. Um, and we're going to do that. Uh, we're going to be prepared for it, and hopefully, it doesn't happen. As Stephen mentioned, you know, staffing continues to be a problem. Uh, you know, we uh, uh, we like most hospitals in the state of Vermont uh, are seeing today uh, more difficult to recruit than in the past. Uh, and I don't profess to to be able to explain why that is. Uh, some suggest that you know people are. Are being paid very generously uh, uh, unemployment, uh, and and so some folks uh, are staying staying on unemployment rather than working. Uh, I suspect that's that's part of it. Um, I also believe that when uh, organizations uh, reduced staffing levels, implemented furloughs, and cut services and programs during the height of the pandemic, something that Grace Cottage did not do. Um, a lot of people um, found other things to, to do to earn a living. And now that we are seeing volumes uh, returning and demand returning, um, those folks are not, uh, are not sitting by their phones waiting for a call to come back to work. Uh, and I knew that was going to be a problem. It's one of the reasons why I didn't want to put people on the street at Grace Cottage during the height of the pandemic. Um, and so hospitals that um, are now trying to grow and recruit and increase staffing levels are having a hard time of it, um, which is creating, uh, you know, an escalation and a bidding war and, and pricing escalation for um, interim staffing solutions. And 
Uh, we're even feeling that at Grace Cottage. So even though our turnover has not been very high, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's not. We have not had the uh, the quick and and, and easy success of, of filling positions when people do decide uh, to leave the organization, and that's why we have more uh, more travelers, more locums now than we've generally have had in the past. So that's definitely a risk. Um, we continue to believe that uh, increasing access to primary care not only is good for Grace Cottage, but it's good for the community. It's good for um, uh, for uh, lowering costs of health care in the state, across the state of Vermont. Um, we, uh, uh, we have a, a, a bit busier than normal pedi pediatric practice. We had two providers, uh, we're losing one of them. And so we, uh, we really feel that there's an opportunity to get another pediatrician or family practitioner who can take care of kids and grow our pediatric program uh, in the coming year and in years uh, uh, to come. Uh, and we did make the decision this year to uh, hire a second behavioral health provider. Uh, we have one currently right now working with a couple of social workers, uh, but he his practice is currently uh, you know bursting at the seams and it's getting harder and harder to get patients in to see him. And so we're looking for a second behavioral health provider, which I think will obviously will double our access and uh, help us to move patients through our, our primary care practices. Because right now, when a family practitioner or an internal medicine uh, provider can't get somebody in to see our behavioral health provider, then they have to manage the patient's behavioral health issues themselves. It's not something, it's not their sweet spot. It's not something they like to do. And it just bogs down their ability to efficiently take care of their non-behavioral health patients. So we do need another provider. and We're going to recruit somebody this year uh, if everything goes according to plan. So those are our risks and opportunities uh, currently. Um, on the value-based care uh, participation um, question, um, we continue to have uh, open dialogue with uh, One Care Vermont. Uh, we are uh, optimistic that they're going to be able to assist us in joining um, the uh, ACO uh, potentially as early as uh, 2023. Um, you know, our participation has to be different than a, than a, a traditional uh, community uh, uh, hospital in the state of Vermont. We're, we're more like, a, like a, a, a practice than we are like a hospital. And we're currently talking with them about uh, risk mitigation. We're talking about um, uh, revenue flow and uh, reimbursement flow and how that would work for a hospital like Grace Cottage. And uh, I think we, we're, we're, getting, we're getting to the point where it's starting to, to make sense for us to participate. I know we're the only hospital in the state right now who are not card carrying members of One Care Vermont. And uh, uh, I look forward to our continued discussions with Vicki uh, Lohner and her team uh, in uh, 2022. And hopefully by, by mid-year, um, initiating uh, some, some agreements to, uh, to present to their board and to our board, and hopefully having us join and being participants uh, in 2023. Any questions there? Uh, on the capital budget side, uh, you know, because this this year we've had uh, we've had a bottom line, which is something I, we don't often say at Grace Cottage. Uh, we've been able to spend some money on capital, uh, and uh, yeah, I'd be lying to you if I if I told you we've had money uh, for the past couple of years to keep up with our capital needs. We have not, uh, but. Uh, it's, it's reassuring to see that, that we're able to spend a little bit of money on capital. Uh, and our plans going forward in 2022 are to, uh, uh, to upgrade our ultrasound services. Uh, we're going to have to do some paving. Our parking lots are really starting to suffer. Uh, we're going to be upgrading some of our HVAC uh, services with, with really with high efficiency um, uh, mini split systems, which uh, provide localized uh, uh, thermostatic control to uh, allow our employees to keep temperatures at a uh, 
at an efficient level and uh, and lower our, our costs for for heating and, and cooling. Uh, we've got some IT upgrades that we're planning to do uh, this year. Uh, however, we, we have no no uh, plans to submit any, any CON projects uh, in 2022. Just spending some money on some day-to-day -day operating needs, uh, capital operating needs for the hospital. Uh, COVID-19, well, I think we've, we've dabbled uh, on uh, the impact of COVID throughout our presentation. Uh, this slide just kind of summarizes the fact that um, uh, we've had to limit uh, uh, access to our providers because of the um, uh, the infectious uh, nature of the, the virus and having to uh, extend uh, appointment slots so that we could terminally clean and disinfect exam rooms. Uh, we've had to um, provide care to patients via telephone and telehealth uh, technology. So a lot of our patients actually um, were able to work with their providers without having to physically come into the, to the hospital to see them face to face. That's a really good thing, and I think it's a it was an opportunity for us to test some of those um, those care solutions. And we, we, like most organizations, will probably probably be continuing to avail ourselves of some of that technology uh, in the future. Uh, but it's not uh, the optimum way of taking care of patients by any means. We still believe that face to face with the provider is really the best way of taking care of our patients. And the sooner we can we can uh, get back to the normal efficiencies of bringing patients through the organization, uh, putting them in an exam room in front of a physician or APP, uh, the sooner we can get back to the efficiencies of taking care of our patients the way we have in the past. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any any other questions you might have about COVID and the impact that it's had on our organization, but. Uh, uh, suffice to say, I think we've, we've really done a great job of managing uh, care during a very turbulent uh, and challenging uh, time for us and for all hospitals in the state of Vermont. And that's the end of our slide deck. Thank you so much, Doug, and also thank you, Steve. Uh, we're going to start the board questions with board member Pelham, Tom. Um, thank you all. Um, it's uh, small is beautiful in my mind, and I'm I'm uh, happy to see that uh, uh, you know you're looking down the road and seeing a future for yourself. Um, uh, that's that's just it's just always nice to have those small outliers out there, kind of proving that just you know that they that they can can be a little bit more nimble and quick on their feet and and uh, serve their communities. I don't have a lot of questions. I mean, small is beautiful in that regard too, that it's not sometimes the smaller the budget, the less complicated it is. Um, I did spend some time on the uh, the Medicare advance and I'm just kind of wanting to kind of go over that a little bit uh, with you to check my math. Um, as I, uh, I could tie uh, your um, appendix seven out to your balance sheet and that all made sense to me. Um, but I have, uh, so I'm looking at your uh, Medicare Advance repayment, and you have a recorded liability um, at the end of 2021 or September 30, 2021, at 3.99 million, and that drops uh, on Appendix Seven to 1.856 million at the end uh, at as of September 30th, 2022, um, and uh, so it looks like kind of the the, the repayment rate uh, for uh, that year annual period was uh, a little over two million bucks, two point one four million dollars, which uh, averages out to one hundred and seventy eight thousand uh, dollars a month. And so um, I'm just uh, asking or trying to understand that uh, given the remaining liability of one point eight five six million um, at the end of September as of September 30th, 2022, whether that that is what you expect to be facing going into 2023 uh, with about 10 months left of, of uh, uh, kind of recapture um, in, in, in Medicare payments. Is that a, a kind of a rough uh, view of, of, that, of that repayment plan? 
Yes, Tom, it will continue into 2023 before it's finally all paid off. And if, unless they change it again, I believe actually, because at the end of 23, we had gotten part of our money in April of 2020, about half of it, give or take. Um, it was like 2.9 million of it we got in April. The remainder of it, another 2.9 roughly came in September. And the repayment starts from a year after you get it. So we actually started paying back in April of 21 on the first 2.9 million. And just starting now, we'll be starting in September on the second 2.9 million. And it, there's a graduated payment that gets higher toward the end after, I think it's after another year. I would have to go back and look. They changed it so many times and they may very well change it again. But um, yes. So, uh, so, so uh, a bunch of this will carry forward into 2023. Correct. Um, yeah. Right. And uh, and you and you have a staggered staggered start uh, based on on the, the the two allocations. Correct. Okay. Basically, because right. they recalculated it wrong the first time. So my next question is on value based participation, and this is just a, an observation. Um, I, I kind of uh, get a sense that um, your big brother, or big sister, which is uh, Mount Scutney in my book. Um, is has the same kind of uh, kind of less aggressive approach to value-based uh, care or, or participation than some of the other hospitals. Um, you know, some of the hospitals are up in terms of their FPPs in the in the mid 20 percent now. Um, but uh, so I was I, during our hearing with Mount Scutney, I asked about um, what their you know what their feeling was about Medicaid and whether or not that was in sub some jeopardy um, at Mount Scutney, and uh, the energy that came back through the screen was a surprise. Um, it was like, absolutely not. We love our Medicaid uh, pro, uh, value-based program. Um, it simplifies uh, life and uh, reduces a lot of administrative costs. And so I'm just wondering if you've spent some time with the folks at Mount Scutney. They are bigger than you, but they're, they're the uh, next rung on the ladder. Have you spent any time with the folks at Mount Scutney kind of getting their insight as to uh, how helpful and valuable the Medicaid, uh, the uh, ACO's Medicaid program might be? No, Tom, we, we haven't done that, but that's a great recommendation. I really appreciate you bring, you know pointing that out to us and I will, I will definitely reach out to them. Uh, yeah. that's, that's, great, that's a great idea. Uh, because the more you know, we're, we're going to need that information when we when we present you know this to our local board here at Grace Cottage, and to the extent that we can get you know some some positive feedback on the impact that it's had on another hospital in the state, uh, uh, the easier it will be for us to to reach a decision, hopefully a positive one. Yeah, well, I think Mount Scott, the folks in Mount Scottney, folks that are your counterparts, will. Um, uh, be a soulmate in that regard. Uh, I, I was just surprised at the le level of energy and, and the pushback on my question. You right. know, uh, so um, the my next question is: I'm looking at just your salaries. I'm listening to your your you know your narrative and your uh, you know kind of voiceover on tr the travelers and what an extensive increase uh, that is. And so looking at salaries from 2020 actual at 16.6 million, uh, 2021 projected at 17.5 million, and 2022 budget at 18.4 million. So those are a little over 5% increases each year. Um, so how, how have you rolled into the 2020, uh, the 2022 budget the increases in travel costs that you're experiencing in 2021 projected? The actual traveler costs budgeted in 22, um, I believe the only departments are actually or any traveler costs budgeted in are nursing. We, you know, when, at the time we did the budget, um, we had in the building one physical therapy traveler that we were 
expecting would be gone by the beginning of the fiscal year and we would have replaced that person with a staff member which may still happen or shortly thereafter um the radiology one again we had no intention of having a radiology traveler that just happened a couple of days ago when we published the mandatory covid vaccine policy and he chose to not work here anymore because he doesn't want to get vaccinated the, the way i budget travelers in general so in the nursing department is i budget all of the ftes presuming they're filled under salaries i then budget a premium above that under agency staffing so for instance if a full-time nurse costs me fifty thousand dollars a year to be here they'd be fifty thousand dollars in the salary line if the, if that same position as a traveler was going to cost me seventy five thousand i would put the extra twenty five thousand on the agency line still in the nursing department because you never really know i mean we could you know, a lot of years when I do the budget, we might have three nurses in the building and by October 1st, they're gone. I mean, we have gotten down to zero more than once as far as travelers go. Sitting here today, I truly don't see that happening this year, but, um, you know, we are aggressively recruiting. Hopefully we'll be able, that the, hopefully the, the rad tech position will only be here for one stint, a 12 week period. The rehab travelers, uh, again, were very, desperately trying to hire permanent positions for those the nurse travelers you know at this point i think we probably going forward at least for the whole next year we'll have three to four in there because there's just not nurses around anywhere so what i'm what i'm taking away from that is that there is some risk there that uh um that you uh, in terms of whether it's your uh, agency or uh, right. in the salary right. budget you you might not um you, you you haven't folded into 2022b the amount of travelers you now have uh, have uh um no a line nope. with your hospital no nope. only in the nursing department and i don't believe there was even i think when i did the nursing i believe i only budgeted to have two yep but you okay. know and we we may get it back down to two shortly after the beginning of the year but it it goes up and down well, good luck with that. It, it's amazing the stories that we're hearing about the, oh, the escalation of travel, travel costs. It's, it's incredible. Um, and I think my final question is in terms of when when you have to hand off an acute care patient to um, a, another provider partner somewhere out there, who are your partners that you're aligned with and and have those relationships changed um, uh, in the last year or so uh, with COVID? I would say that, you know, our primary partners, of course, always have been, you know, the close, generally the closest hospital that the patient can safely go to. You know, Brattleboro certainly would be the first choice if whatever, if they've got a bed and can take care of what this patient needs. Second is usually either Cheshire or Dartmouth. Um, occasionally, and usually it's one of those three unless the beds aren't available. Um, I know the other day they had somebody in the ER and they called all of them. I don't think they called BMH because I think the person needed more than that, but they those were all full. Um, they called UVM, they called Bay State, they, call, they eventually took the patient to Albany after calling like five different hospitals because nobody had a bed um so and it, that's you know not because of covid so much as everybody's been busy right now um the last few months so would you see the uh new bed tower at dartmouth as an as a an asset relative to uh uh your operation oh most certainly yeah um, i mean i think I know when they said that the other day, I think they, I think it was Dartmouth. They said they had like 60, this was one day over the weekend. I think they had 60 patients in the ER waiting for their own beds. They didn't expect to have a bed for at least a day or more. So they were just packed and then some, they had more patients than they could take care of of, the, of their own. 
Well, that's all my question. I, I do I do make note of the fact that if you take your your change in charge over the last three years at uh, I think it's like three point two percent or something like that, yeah. and uh, average that in with a five percent, and we're still at three point six percent, you know, as as a trend rate. So um, um, I, I I think that's that's just an important factoid to stick in the back of the mind as we go forward here. So Agreed thank you. you. Those are my questions. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Next, we're going to go to board member Yusufer Maureen. Uh, first, thank you for the presentation and everything you've been doing um, throughout the year and the pandemic. Um, just a couple questions. You talked about um, the Medicare Advance, but you also talked about some unused CARES Act funding that you may have to pay back. Um, do you have the specifics on how much that might be and the time? Uh, yes, I can tell you. Hold on just one moment. I'll pull it up. I think it's just over a million dollars. Oops. I haven't done the final um, calculation of it yet because we're working on the reporting as we speak. Um, but at the moment, it's roughly 1.4 million, but I know that I have some capital costs and stuff that I can take out of there first. So I think it's probably going to be at just over a million, 1.1 maybe, that we end up having to send back. Okay, and that's projected in the 22 cash flow? Yes. Okay. Um, and then, you know, as your net patient revenue um, trend from 19 to 20, 21, um, is, is a little bit of an outlier from most of the other hospitals. Most of the other hospitals in the state saw a decline in 20. Um, and, you know, certainly you're impacted by, you know, second home people who come up. And we know a lot of people did relocate places throughout Vermont um, during the pandemic. So one concern or, you know, I would have might be that some of those people aren't going to be able to stay through this, this year as they did last year. And can you isolate, I guess, the impact of maybe the out-of-state people? And, and was that driving some of your increase in 2021? Um, and then, you know, potentially, um, if they can't work remotely anymore and their kids have to go back to school and they didn't permanently relocate here, um, you know, you might see some impact from that. So I guess, how, how have you accounted for that in your funding? I think, you know, a lot of the increase in net patient revenue for our facility in both 20 and 21 and going forward is the fact of our Medicare reimbursement based on um, primarily the critical access hospital, but also the rural health clinic. Like for instance, when we submitted our fiscal year 20 cost report, we had $2.3 million settlement due to us by Medicare which directly increases the net patient revenue because it reduces the Medicare contractual allowance. And, you know, that the plus side of the increased expenses is Medicare is paying that much more of a bill. For instance, if before, if a bill was $100 and they were paying 65 of it, once you submit that cost report and you, they're taking into account expenses, particularly if they're in highly reimbursable areas such as the inpatient unit so the traveler cost is a good example medicare is paying me if we have 85 percent of our inpatients are medicare medicare is paying me 85 percent of those costs so having that additional hundred dollars an hour isn't as detrimental to me because medicare is going to give me 85 of it versus say rutland regional that hundred dollars an hour is a hundred dollars that comes out of their bottom line um, truthfully, all those out-of-staters, commercial people that came here, I don't believe is a large increase in our net patient revenue. Most, you know, you might have had a few of them coming into the emergency room. Um, chances are they would have come into the emergency room whether they were living here or not because you would have had other people traveling to the area. Our emergency room volumes aren't that much different might be a different out-of-state person coming because they are staying in their second home here versus traveling through, but not a huge difference. You know, the other, and 
would they be coming to get primary care for the short time they've been here? Maybe, maybe not. We've had some increase in our primary care as a result of second homeowners, but a lot of them, if they were only here for, you know, the short time, their expectations are staying in their second home for until the COVID's over, they probably haven't changed their primary care service. You know what I'm saying? So I don't think our volume currently is drastically affected a lot by those second homeowners. Okay. And do you have any concerns about the Medicare settlements in the future? I mean, I know some hospitals have had some uh, issues there in the past. And so just making sure, you know, that that's not going to reverse at all or, you know, I mean, truthfully, like the current year, you know, when I first got that money back in the spring, I said, you know, what I said immediately when we got it is we need to be prepared that if volumes are high in 21, and expenses aren't, um, we need to be prepared for that fact that we might be getting overpaid throughout 21. But truthfully, as we sit here today, with the large increase in expenses, particularly in the nursing unit and reimbursable areas, and the fact that our inpatient volumes, although they're good, aren't actually even at that, aren't even at the level of last year, I think we're fairly safe this year. You okay. can't tell until you actually do the cost report, but it's, I'm fairly confident we're not gonna have a large settlement due to them this year. And then on the retail pharmacy loss, can you kind of go through the accounting of that? Like, like, is there more revenue? Like what's the rev, like how, how does that net out to a loss on the revenue line? The retail pharmacy has, been operating at a loss for years. It continues to get bigger. Um, the problem is, which you can ask any retail pharmacy, um, third party payers for health insurances, they all use pharmacy benefit administrators. In a lot of cases, we get paid less than a drug costs us to fill the prescription. You know, we we might actually pay $5 for it and the total reimbursement might be $3, which not only doesn't cover the cost of the drugs, it doesn't cover anything for the pharmacist time and all of that to fill it. There's a retail pharmacy from an actual pharmacy standpoint, the prescription filling is a losing operation. Now, you know, there is a reason Walgreens and CVSs and all those have those in the back of the store because they make their money on the stuff you buy when you walk to the back of the store. We, although have a small front store, people don't buy a lot of that kind of stuff in a small local mom and pop organization, which is another reason there's almost no mom and pop organizations anymore in a lot of small towns. I mean, I know that a lot of the ones in this state, just in Woodstock recently, that one suddenly closed, the one that's been there forever. Um, because you just can't make it support it. Um, you know, if we were running a true business model here, we would not have a retail pharmacy. You know, we choose to keep the retail pharmacy um, because it's a badly needed community service for our patients. Because as Doug said, the next closest pharmacies are basically 30 minutes away, Brattleboro or Bellis Falls. Um, and it's a valuable asset to the community. It's also helpful for us in the fact that we've got the ability to have a couple, it allows us the ability to have a couple more pharmacists on staff than we would normally have if we were only running the hospital pharmacy. But within the building, within our organization, we have five full-time pharmacists, which allows for a little co cross coverage if something happens to one of the hospital pharmacists, you know, one's on vacation and somebody else gets sick, you've got somebody available to help cover. Um, so that's a benefit, but it is it worth that loss? Probably not. I think the other, pro probably the most important benefit of having uh, a, a retail pharmacy across the street from the hospital is that our primary care providers have much more control over um, their patients' um, access and use of prescription medications. Right. So when, when one of our providers orders a drug for a patient who really needs to be taking medication for their acute problem, he or she knows whether that, whether that patient 
is actually getting their medication or not. And the fact that the, the, the drug is across the street and they can, they, can only have to, they can walk right across and get it before they get in their car and go home, the likelihood of them taking the medication that's being ordered for them is much greater, which means better control of the care of the patient and 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 healthier patients uh, over the long run so it's a bit of a lost leader for us but i really believe that if if the nearest pharmacy for our patients was a half an hour away uh the health of our patients would would decline as a result of that for access reasons for cost reasons um for a variety of reasons so i've got providers who will, will call a patient and say look you know, I, 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 I sent the order for your, for your, your prescription to, this, to the, the pharmacy across the street, but, uh, but you haven't picked it up. Is there a problem? Do you need help paying for it? Um, and, and so it just makes it easier for them to manage the medication utilization of their patients. The other important thing to remember is if you go remember back on the slide, I said that we included the um, 340B retail contract pharmacy revenue, that million dollars of revenue is a result of us operating the retail pharmacy as a contract pharmacy. And that's what allows us to generate that. If Messenger Valley Pharmacy didn't exist, yes, we could contract with all of those surrounding pharmacies because all of our patients would have to go somewhere. So I would have to then contract with every pharmacy in Brattleboro, every pharmacy in Bellis Falls, Walmart, um, all of those. And I would be able to keep some of that contract pharmacy money, but it would be a drastically smaller amount. It would be far, you know, I, maybe a conservative estimate is I might be able to contract with enough of them to keep half of that money. So I'd be losing a half a million dollars there and only doing away with a $170,000 loss in the retail pharmacy. So it, you know, it, something we have to try and remember when we look at it, you can't really net the two together, but in theory, one is responsible for the other. Right. Okay. Um, and my last question is: I first, I do you know agree that in uh, you know the COVID has strengthened the balance sheets of, of many of the hospitals because you know the the CARES Act and some of the money did what what it was supposed to do right in a very unfortunate situation. So looking at that, looking at where your cash balance is, and then looking at your P and L. And you've talked about, you know, potentially being conservative on the top line and pessimistic on the expense line, you know, with those kind of going opposite directions. Just just really wondering, you know, how, how we should think about that. I mean, you know, it seems like there's a potential that um, you will do better in in 22. Uh, you certainly have a strong balance sheet and, and cash flow. And I appreciate what Tom said about your average for your commercial rate, but you are asking for a 5% rate this year, which is, is above, you know, what we'd be looking at uh, or what we had, you know, put out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know it's small dollars. We've gone through this before, but it, it's, it's small dollars to the hospital, but not to the individual, right? A 5% is a 5% increase to an individual when you look at their commercial rate. I mean, total dollars to the system, you're right. It's, it's not significant, but um, just wondering how I should think about it because I, I think you've got a strong position and I think you're hedged, hedged a bit from what you're telling us right. on, you know, well, you need to remember that <clears throat> that 5%, the only individual that's going to pay that 5% is a self-pay person who isn't getting any reduced fee. The majority of our self-pay patients have some sort of a reduced fee. Very few of them pay 100% of the charge based on income. Um, a commercial patient isn't going to pay 5% because almost all of our commercial reimbursement is based on a fee schedule. Um, the clinics particularly, even within the hospital, the majority of lab, x-ray and all those, you know, so if I'm charging $100 for a lab test, I'm going to now charge 105 but I'm only going to get whatever Blue Cross says is the reimbursement rate for that particular CPT code. It doesn't matter that I'm charging an extra $5. I'm going to write off another $5 in contractual allowance on that particular test, aside from whatever they're increasing. So if they increase 
3%, say, for inflation from one year to the next, I'm going to write off 2%. There are a few areas where we do get paid based on a percent of charges um, in some of the outpatient departments, but very few of them. I mean, in, in theory, I mean, what does happen on a lot of the charges, and I understand what you're saying and those specific, but ultimately, if we have commercial rate increases, um, then, you know, the the commercial payer pays through the premium, you know, the premium mm -hmm. that they pay. I'm not saying yeah. they're necessarily no, I don't. here, but it, it, you know, if all the hospitals take a 5% increase, then, you know, their premiums are going to go up by 5%. They're, what they may pay to you may be the same because their deductible stayed the same and things like that. But, right. but I, you know, and I understand some things don't go up, but. Um, and, and you know, and remembering what Tom said about looking at, you know, if you average it over two or three years, it's been a, we've had a, re, a lower than average increase the last couple of years. No, absolutely true. But I also look at the balance sheet and the strength yeah. of the balance sheet and the cash. I mean, you know, looking just at this chart, right, the, you know, where you were pre-pandemic at $252,000 mm -hmm. to post-pandemic at, or we're well, not post-pandemic, I shouldn't say that. Sorry about that. But, yeah. you know. At, we wish. I know we, we wish we were post pandemic, but you know, ending at 3.2 million, um, you know, is, uh, is very significant. And as Doug said, you know, we've got, we've been putting off a lot of capital projects that need to be done. You know, I mean, things such the things that you keep putting off, such as paving and all those things that really do have to be done to keep the facility safe for patients coming here. So, um, yeah, it's nice to have a few dollars in the bank. Um, but we need to do some of that work too. I'm all set, thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Next, we're gonna to go to board member Holmes, Jessica. Great, well, thank you both uh, for the presentation and you know, again, for all that you've done for your community during this pandemic, it's really appreciated. Um, I guess I'm gonna pick up a little bit maybe where Maureen left off on the rate requests. I just wanna think through a little bit of this. Um, with you. So you're asking for 5% rate increase. Um, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that, you know, this higher than your usual. Admittedly, um, rate request is needed to cover escalating costs, uh, operating costs, which I think you've made a strong case about. Um, your inflation calculation in the appendix puts those operating, escalating operating costs at 3%. So when you're calculating your rate increase, inflation is obviously one component, 3%. I understand the 3% of the 5% being simply just operating cost growth. Um, some hospitals need additional rate to cover cost shift, recognizing that not all payers are going to even, you know, accommodate right. that percent inflation. But when I look at your payer mix, um, I don't see a lot of cost shift in there to the degree that Medicare and commercial make up about 86% of your gross revenue payer mix and 92% of your, you know, net patient revenue payer mix. And as you mentioned just before, as a critical access hospital, you're largely reimbursed at cost for Medicare. So really most of your cost shift is going to come through Medicaid, which agreeably does not cover any inflationary costs. Right. But Medicaid's about, you know, 8%, I think, of your, you know, NPR or so it's a very small component of, of your revenue anyway. You have a small Medicaid. Well, it's, so uh, sorry. Just help me think oh. about yeah. my question. I'm I guess sorry. Is, I'm sorry. You were just talking over each other. I just need. I, I'm time. sorry. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> no, no, no worries. So I'm just thinking about the five percent, three percent, certainly, understandably, operating cost growth. Yep. Help me think from the three to the five. OK, um, so. First, Medicare is the large you're right is the largest percentage payer for the entire facility and they pay one percent less than cost on all of their services at best they pay one percent less they're paying 99 percent of cost um so you've got to make up that percent number one just to cover your costs on a large volume of business the medicaid while you're right our actual net patient revenue and i don't have it in front of me but eight percent even seems low but you can't look at the net patient revenue. You've got to look at the fact that medic, you're right, we're only getting a small percentage of our net patient revenue from, from Medicaid, but the patients are a lot more than 8% of our patients. You've got to look you at the gross, gross about, Yeah, your gross patient right. revenue is at 14%. Yeah. 
Medicaid. Right. So yeah. you've got, you know, that's a big percentage that you've got to take care of all those patients where you're getting less than half your costs back on. Um, and truthfully, not even the commercial payers don't even all pay, in some cases, their full costs. Um, but it's mostly the, it, it is the cost shift to those Medicaid and the fact that Medicare is paying less than the actual cost on the biggest percentage of our business. And in the rural health clinic, even is the reimbursement is even worse. Our cost per encounter in Medicaid, because they subject it to a limit, is paying about, I think it's 40% of our actual cost on all our rural health clinic visits. So we're actually, I mean, at some point it'd be great to hear you know, maybe in next year's budget, trying to understand what component of your rate request is driven by cost shift so that we can start quantifying that impact across the state. So just a, uh, you know, future thought, it would be helpful. Trying to think about how you would do that. <laughs> but yes, I hear you. Yeah. Um, we can talk about that maybe, you know, as the budget guide cost shift around. Um, did somebody ask, that, was I... Am I good? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess my my next question is, back in December, actually, Congress passed a new law that introduces a new rural emergency hospital Medicare designation. And some researchers are suggesting that small hospitals in rural areas that have net patient revenues less than $20 million, very low, relatively low average daily census, and, and three years of losses might be the most likely to convert. And I'm wondering if you've looked into this new designation, whether it might make sense for Grace, um, especially given the capacity in the southeast corner of the state, particularly as Dartmouth-Hitchcock expands. Is this something that you've thought about moving forward? Um, at the moment, we have not, no. Um, you know, if Dartmouth expands and our average daily census is suddenly one or two rather than 10 or 11, which is what it normally is, that might be worth looking at. Um, I, you know, I'm also not sure that the reimbursement would be a whole lot different. It's still a cost-based reimbursed system, is it not? As a way to keep small hospitals in business that don't qualify to be a critical access hospital is what I was under the impression it was. So um, I don't really think it would, from my understanding is it wouldn't really change the our actual reimbursement very much. They're still only going to cover the cost of keeping the business open. Or the almost Yeah, I think it reduces some of the fixed costs because inpatient largely goes away. So some of the fixed costs of maintaining an inpatient suite is eliminated um, and it effectively becomes, you know, uh, an emergency standing emergency room with some other right. features attached to it. But right. maintaining an you know an inpatient um, floor goes away and therefore the fixed right. cost associated but, with that go away. But our inpatient, we I'm don't sorry, maintain. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't hear that, Jessica. I, I'm still getting overlapping voices there. <laughs> go ahead, Jessica. I was just saying, I think that you lose some of the fixed costs associated with the inpatient floor. And it may be, you know, given that you have rural populations where, where population is declining, and it's difficult to cover those fixed costs. It may be a designation that allows access to care and cost-based reimbursement. Um, so it's a, it's it's a new possibility for hospitals. And as my question, I guess, largely is, are you considering it? And what would what would the factors be that would make you think that that's a good option? Well, I, I would I would say this is this is obviously something we we are aware of, but we have not done a lot of research into what that would mean for us. So. Uh, I have to say um, we have not started our consideration of that as an option, but that's not to say that we won't look at it. Okay, great. Just was a question. Thank you. Thanks, um, Jessica. My last question actually is uh, around Mathematica's analysis. So Mathematica did some in-depth analysis of potentially avoidable utilization at rural hospitals around the country, and they shared some of their results with the board a few weeks ago. Now the results are only for Medicare fee for service, but that actually is your largest, you know, payer group. And and their analysis actually showed that Grace Cottage has the highest rate of admissions for ambulatory sensitive conditions in the state, 
They estimated that 34% of your admissions are for ambulatory sensitive conditions. The state's median was only 19.5. So these are admissions that could have been avoided with, you know, timely appropriate care. So I'm wondering, given your emphasis on primary care, if this number surprises you, do you track this yourself? And if this number does, you know, make some sense for what you're seeing in your inpatient admissions, um, what steps could you take to bring down this potentially avoidable utilization uh, that does seem much higher than the state median? Uh, I, I did. Uh, I did see that data. Um, I was uh, a little bit surprised by it. Um, you know, it's something that we're going to talk about uh, with our medical staff. Um, obviously, you know, we as administrators, um, you know, rely on our on our providers to make care decisions for the patients who, who um, present to our organization. And so I wanna get some feedback from the medical staff in terms of you know, uh, whether they believe that there are th some things we can, can do to uh, avoid some of those, uh, those, those uh, interactions uh, or to, to lower the cost of care for some of those patients. Uh, so I think it's, it's new data for us and we're definitely gonna, gonna do some analysis. Great. Thank you very much. Well, I'd love to hear any follow up on that. You bet. Thank you. That's all my questions, Kevin. Thanks, Jessica. Next, we're going to turn to board member Lunch. Robin. Thank you. Um, it's nice sometimes to be the last person to go because many of my questions have been answered. Um, but I, I did have a couple of um, clarifications I wanted to ask about. Um, the first is it sounds like um, your utilization compared to 2019, which might be considered at least old normal, um, who knows about new normal, um, seems to still be down due to some of your COVID mitigation measures. And uh, you talked in your narrative about the, um, the cleaning and, all, and the reduced number of appointments. I'm wondering if, if that sounds about right to you. Um, or if, if I missed something in reading that your materials. Steven, you, want, you, you want to speak to that? <laughs> I, 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 admit I had trouble hearing the first part. Can you just repeat the first part? Oh, sure. Sorry oh, yeah. about that. Um, Yes, I was just trying to get a sense of your current utilization compared to 2019. Oh, okay. um, you talked in your narrative about some of the mitigation measures you are taking due to COVID, which uh, makes sense. Uh, what we are seeing in some of the other hospitals is a bit of a surge uh, from pent up demand, that kind of thing. And, I, and it didn't seem like you were experiencing that. So I just wanted to get a little color commentary about that. Yeah, I think particularly in the in the rural health clinic um and i believe i talked about that but you know that's the area where we had the biggest limitation on the number of patients we could see by you know it's hard almost impossible say to put three patients through a provider in an hour they're mostly 40 minute appointments now occasionally they'll stick in a 20 but it's so i think that's another reason why even if we don't aren't able to hire the provide the additional providers. I think our volume will probably increase some in the rural health clinic simply by being able to add even a couple more appointments a day to each provider, being able to not have to have the as much social distancing thing like things like that. Um, sure. It also took a lot longer with patients, you know, when we weren't, for instance, say, letting visitors come in with patients where normally quite often it's the husband or wife comes in with you to your appointment and you know you can you get the patient who doesn't understand what's going on you can explain it to them well now they're got to go back out and explain it to the person waiting outside when they're done and it just makes the whole appointment longer um from an inpatient standpoint we really didn't have other than in the beginning when we were having to do COVID tests on all patients coming in. That was limiting our ability to have the number of people in the building because all of those people had to be assumed that they had it for the first two or three sure. days. Now that we can do instant tests, that's much quicker. Um, we didn't. The outpatient during the actual initial parts of the pandemic 
yes, rehab was very low. And then rehab continued even after hospitals opened back up because it took a while for all those people that had missed their surgeries to have them and then need those services, which is probably part of the reason right now that we have two rehab travelers and still have a long wait time. Honestly, if you need to have an initial eval and follow up appointments to be able to get it done. We just can't provide all the outpatient rehab services we need to provide right now. Thank you. Um, and then my other question was, could you, and I'm sorry that I don't remember all of the details of your staffing, but it yep. is tough That's... with 14 hospitals. Um, but I wonder if you could put your vacancies in context. So I know you said you were down uh, in pediatrics, two primary care docs, family practitioners, um, but it, can you sure. give me the context of how many folks you have in, in your rural health clinic? The rural health clinic normally has about, um, rather than just rattle numbers off my head here, hold on just a moment. Sorry. We normally have, have um, we had a half, to go back, start with that with the ones that left. The, the two providers that were left were both half-time, a half-time family practice and a half-time um, pediatrics who had both been here for 30 some odd years and retired early to, they're currently as we speak, riding their bicycles from here to New Mexico. Nice. Very ambitious. <laughs> um, but, so we're trying to replace both of them. Um, what we normally have in the rural health clinic, hold on just a moment, FTE comparison. We have a total in the rural health clinic practitioners, FTE total of, we've had 10.96 in the current year. And, and those are all primary care with the exception of, um, about two that are mental health and although pediatrics is primary care um, about 1.2 of that was pediatrics and then next year what we budgeted was only 10.4 um, which at the moment um, again is same amount of mental health and the rest is primary care great thank you that's very helpful um and that's it for me. Thank you, Robin. I, d I don't really have any questions, Doug or Steve, but I do have a comment. Um, you know, when you take a look at the hospital infrastructure in Vermont, um, much of what you see, especially in your area of the state, along the Connecticut River and the I-91 corridor, um, reflects a, a time period with, um, that was appropriate for the geography and the infrastructure and the demographics of the time, but you worry about it going forward. And I would just strongly encourage you to be proactive in your planning rather than reactive. Steve had mentioned um, you might make a, a different uh, um, case depending on what happens after the bed tower opened at Dartmouth. And Doug, you had uh, mentioned that you thought it would be a very positive thing. And I think it is a positive thing as far as being able to make sure that patients are, are getting um, that uh, hospital care. But I, I don't think that people have paid enough attention to the negative impacts of what that's going to be on the workforce. And when you talk about um, you don't see a way to get away from travelers this year, mm -hmm. I think that can be multiplied exponentially once that construction project is finished and open. So I just strongly encourage you to, you know, to be reaching out to your feeders for your um, new nurses and things like that, because every possible thing that can be done to try to create that workforce is going to be necessary because you're going to get hammered. Yep, I agreed. Okay. Appreciate the comment, Kevin. With that, I'll turn it over to um, the Healthcare Advocates Office for questions. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Kylie. Okay. My name is Kylie Kuiper, and I'm here with Sam Peich, a rec 
representing the Office of the Healthcare Advocates. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking you for your, for your presentation and for all that you do for your community, particularly during the pandemic. Um, as you know, we submitted several pre-hearing questions that primarily focused on race equity efforts. We just wanted to use this time to ask you to focus specifically on how much funding in your current and future budgets have been allocated to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and our race equity focused projects, trainings, or collaborations. Jog, you want to answer that? Um, zero. From a specific standpoint, yes, we don't have a specific line item that is identified for any of those things. Um, Doug can speak to all of what we're currently doing here as far as um, the committees and working to make people realize though we are totally inclusive from whether it be staffing or a patient standpoint, um, to make sure people are understand they're free and welcome to come here. I mean, we don't turn anybody away for anything of any type, um, but we don't have specific light items for that or positions hired just to do that. It's all done by people within the organization. Uh, could you speak a little bit about um, how you assess uh, the needs of your community as far as language access and um, those types of things? It's really, um, uh, you know, it's really based on, on um, actual experience. Um, we, you know, we uh, uh, are, are a small organization, so we can be very adaptable. Uh, and so we're able to, uh, to monitor uh, the needs of our, of our community as it relates to um, uh, diversity and diversity related uh, access issues. Uh, we have a community health needs assessment that we do uh, routinely where we ask our community uh, whether or not we're meeting their needs and we prioritize the feedback we get from our community. Uh, most of the community health care needs uh, that are identified by the community um, are really about about direct uh, care needs like, um, like chronic disease management, mental health, uh, things of that nature. Uh, very, very few needs identified as it relates to ethnicity or um, you know other non-healthcare related diversity issues. Uh, we're always um, quick to respond when we do have uh, identified needs. As, uh, as Stephen mentioned, we are um, working pretty uh, aggressively right now on developing um, our organizational uh, response to uh, to um, um, the needs of the LGBTQ community. We're working closely with uh, the Human Rights Campaign uh, Healthcare Equity uh, Index to try and get our organization listed with them. Uh, and we're in the process now of going through all of our written materials uh, and doing some diversity training with our employees uh, uh, to raise awareness uh, on how we uh, take care of those those individuals with um, uh, those types of, of uh, unique uh, needs. And I think we're, you know, this is something that's relatively new for Grace Cottage, but it's not new, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, of communities uh, across the across the nation and across the state of Vermont. So, uh, like a lot of hospitals, we're starting to recognize that uh, making sure that our community, our patients, our customers understand that we are a welcoming organization uh, is really important to us. And we're gonna continue that work uh, going into the next year. It's one of our, our new goals for our operating plan for 2022. Okay, thank you. Understandably, a number of the hospitals have expressed concerns about taking on financial risk, particularly through the ACO. And in your response to the board's questions, you wrote that you were looking for ways to minimize your risk if you participate in One Care's payment programs, and you discussed that a little bit today. Um, we understand that there are different possible payment structures through the ACO, um, but we are interested, uh, you being the smallest hospital, what your thoughts are on the risk you take on uh, if you were to take on fixed prospective payments 
versus the risk you take on currently through the fee-for-service payment structure? Well, we, we've we've looked at uh, both sides of that of that knife, and um, you know the the, the reality is uh, we're just not large enough, diverse enough, or financially um, uh, in a position to um, to take uh, you know risk that other, other organizations can take uh, because of the the small size of our of our hospital, and so what it really comes down to is you know. We, we, we believe that we have a, a very important role to play in lowering the cost of care in the state of Vermont. Uh, primary care and, uh, and wellness uh, is where it all starts. Keeping people healthy and out of the hospital is where cost control and cost containment starts. And that's what we do best. And so we wanna, we, we believe we can contribute and can help the ACO uh, in its efforts to lower the, the cost of care, but we, we just can't be in a position to share in the downside risk if um, if the ACO is not successful in lowering the cost of care. And quite frankly, uh, we have not heard a tremendous amount of positive feedback on the results that the ACO has been able to deliver as it relates to lowering the cost of care in the state of Vermont. Uh, in, in fact, we hear more about what it costs to operate the ACO and or or, or not uh, hear about the, the what the costs are to operate the ACO because apparently that information is is confidential. But um, I think uh, uh, like all Vermonters, uh, we're beginning to to uh, to question whether the ACO is going to be able to really achieve its long term mission. And um, until we have some comfort in knowing that the ACO is going to survive and is going to deliver on its objectives of lowering the cost of care in the state of Vermont, uh, our participation really needs to be guarded. And we need to make sure that we don't add risk and cost to our organization because every dollar that we have at our disposal goes into caring for our patients. We can't afford to pay uh, you know, bills to keep the ACO afloat if, uh, if its objectives fail. And so, those are the discussions we're having with the ACO, and and you know we want to participate, we want to help. Uh, we think we have a role to play, and hopefully we'll get there. But they have to treat us a little differently than than organizations that have more direct impact on controlling costs, like UVM and some of the larger hospitals that have very very expensive programs and take care of very very complex and expensive uh, uh, care for the Vermont, the, you know the 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 residents of this state. Hopefully I answered, answered the question. Oh, well, the, uh, that was a, I mean, I appreciate your answer and it, it was interesting. Uh, what I was actually specifically trying to get at was, um, was what are your thoughts on budgeting with, with fixed perspective payments versus fee for service? I, I can imagine that there is different pluses and minuses. Uh, if you were going to have a, like a per patient payment that, so you kind of know ahead of time or more of a global budget that you know ahead of time that doesn't increase or decrease based on volume versus the current situation where you get fee for service that does increase and decrease based on volume, but it's less predictable um, how much you'll be taking in. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious as a small hospital, as a particularly small hospital, um, what you see as the pluses and minuses of those two payment structures. Does that make sense? I think so. I think you just answered it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if we if we can if we can uh, reach an agreement with the ACO where where for example if we enter uh, as as participants in the Medicare most organizations go in with their their Medicare uh, 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 patients first uh, and and if we know on a month to month basis what our payment will be for caring for our Medicare uh, beneficiaries. Uh, yes, it, it simplifies the, the, you know, the, the, the cost accounting and, and the program um, uh, profitability analysis, uh, you know, by, by knowing, you know, what that reimbursement is going to be uh, going forward and then having adjustments, you, you know, from year to year based on actual, um, it does simplify things. Um, and so if we can, get them to agree to do that for us, um, uh, we're willing to, to do that. 
But again, we, you know, the, the one thing that, that causes us pause is the, the fact that uh, uh, there is a downside risk uh, to, uh, to being in the ACO. And we don't have any any uh, excess uh, cash to, uh, to 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 put at risk for for participating, and so we're trying to negotiate a, an arrangement with the ACO that treats us differently than a full service community hospital because we're not a full service community hospital. We're, we're much more like a like a like a rural health clinic or or primary care practice than we are like a hospital, and so. Uh, our hope is that we can uh, participate and be treated that way. Uh, that makes us more comfortable. And, and I think that uh, we're going to get there. Uh, the ACO has been very collaborative and very uh, accommodating to our concerns. They understand what they are. And uh, they're working diligently to come up with a structure that will work for them and work for us. Kylie, might I interject just for a second here? Absolutely. So, Doug, I just want to uh, make sure that the uh, record is right because everything is being transcribed. And in earlier in your hearings, um, I believe it was Stephen that talked about um, looking at Medicaid. But in your, your your answer that you just made to Kylie, you mentioned Medicare several times. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Medi Medicaid was what I meant. Kevin, thank That's you. That's like not, that. and it's it's a common mistake. But I just want to make sure the record is accurate, and so. Sorry, yeah, I wish they didn't both start with an M. It would be a lot easier if, uh, if yes. that were the case. But, you know, Medicaid was what I meant, not Medicare. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that clarification. I have no further questions. And did Sam have any questions, Kylie? Nope, I believe that's it for us. No questions okay. for me. Great. So next I'm going to turn to public comment on the Grace Cottage uh, budget presentation. Is there any member of the public who wishes to offer comment at this time? If so, either raise your hand in the Teams function or just begin speaking. And hearing none, I want to thank you gentlemen for uh, a good presentation this morning and um, your thoughtful answers. And at this point, I'm going to place the Green Mountain Care Board meeting in recess until 10:22 for a 10-minute bio break at which time we will commence with Springfield Hospital's hearing. Thank you everyone. <laughs>